As everybody filters back in to take their seats, I'd just like to reflect that what an important conference this is every year when it, we bring advocates and indeed advocates of people with disability for families, for carers, and indeed people with disability themselves who are self-advocates. It is an absolute privilege for me as a person with disability, as somebody who lives with cerebral palsy, to get to share today and indeed every day with you. And indeed, we need many more voices alongside us and with us to ensure that we create change and spaces in community and in work and indeed in all parts of our social and political systems to ensure that the voices of people with disability are recognised. And I think that this conference is indeed one of the many and varied ways that indeed the state of Victoria is seeking to hear and respond to the voices of people with disability and their advocates. Delegates, you'll be familiar with, as we move to our next session following morning tea, that advocates are all too familiar with tackling issues around ensuring people get what they are entitled to within a national system, within national systems such as the NDIS and indeed our Centrelink system. How can we do this more eff efficiently while at the same time empowering our clients to effectively advocate for themselves. It is with this in mind that I introduce our next session. And our next session is Welfare Self-Serve, Empowering People with Disabilities to Help Themselves. So if I could please invite Kerry Cassidy, the Executive Officer of the Disability Resource Centre, and Gillian Wilkes, Director of Social Security Rights Victoria, to the stage. Hi everybody, thanks for having us here this morning. Um, before I hand over to Gillian, just a few things in introduction. Um, a lot of you would be aware, and a lot of you would find that working within government systems is, is a frustrating aspect of advocacy. Um, and it was clear from our training session in July that disability support pension issues are critical for our clients from assisting them to gather evidence, uh, evidence for their applications, um, for ARRO reviews, job capacity assessments, um, navigating program of support and appeals. I know in our organisation, um, we've had a significant increase in demand for assistance around the DSP. Gillian's gonna elaborate more on the reasons for that and how our organisations have worked together with people who've experienced the DSP as con consumers, family members, advocates, community legal centres, doctors. And we've created a couple of resources um, to assist these groups. Ooh. Did that work? Yes. Wrong way. <laughs> Wrong way. <laughs> the top one. No. Oh, it's the green, big green arrow. Okay, before we start, uh, firstly, just a reminder that this presentation is for information and education purposes. It's not to be interpreted as individual or legal advice. And that's why we work with SSRV, because you can count on lawyers to think about these things. And they were really um, instrumental in making sure we were um, kept true to legislation throughout our project. Um, before I hand over, um, just a bit about us. The Disability Resources Centre has been around since 1981. We're a member-driven organisation, staffed and managed by people with disabilities. And uh, we've always had a strong human rights focus. The DRC provides individual advocacy to adults with disability. We work on systemic issues and we provide education on those issues and how they affect people. Um, in recent times, our focus has been on the DSP, and now we are doing a project also through the Advocacy Futures Program around accessible public transport. Over to you, Gillian. Thank you. Which one do you use? The green, big green one. Okay. <laughs> okay, so 
Thank you very much um, for having me here today. Social Security Rights Victoria is a statewide community legal centre and we've been around for about 30 years. We were previously called the Welfare Rights Unit and SSRV has had a long history of working with the disability advocacy sector, which has been more formalised in the last couple of years. Um, SSRV provides um, legal services to um, vulnerable and disadvantaged Victorians and to people who support them, so that might be carers or other workers. And it's particularly in relation to uh, when people have disputes with Centrelink decisions. So we have a um, telephone advice service for the general public. We have a worker advice line, and I've got, my apologies, I was too late to get them in the show bags, but they're out the front, postcards about both of those services. We provide more intensive casework and legal representation assistance to clients. We also work with other organisations to try and change laws and policies and procedures that aren't working well and we direct our education efforts at other workers. Um, so that's a bit of an overview of our, our work. So I think Kerry's really touched on this, why are Kerry and I are sitting on the stage together this, this morning. Uh, and it's because over the last couple of years, our organisations, along with others, have worked on the development of resources around the disability support pension. And that's had a lot of benefits, both in terms of the individual resources that have been developed, but also in terms of better knowledge of the other sectors, relationship building and other activities that have come from that, which we'll talk about a bit later on. Okay, um, so frustrations navigating the DSP spread across every area of advocacy. Um, for, a, for a service like the DSP to be fair and accessible, it should be designed so individuals who need income support do not face unnecessary barriers. And we believe um, that the best situation would be if individuals who need income support that they are able to understand their requirements, that they are able to provide the information that's needed, and that Centrelink will be there to support them. And what we find with many of our clients is that that is just not the case. Now, um, changing the current state of Centrelink requires ongoing systemic work. And we've certainly, we certainly have and will continue to participate in this space, however, that wasn't the focus of our project um, and the resources that we've created. It's more about how we can assist people to work within the current system. And as the process has become increasingly complex, people have sought out help from organi organisations like community legal centres, financial counsellors and advocates. And our fo focus has been to build tools to assist workers in this space and to create accessible information so that people with disabilities and their supports have the best chance of making a successful claim if they're eligible. So I'm not telling anybody anything new that um, access to social security is a basic human right. It's referred to under various United um, Nations instruments and it's encapsulated in Australian law. And the disability support pension, you know, is a, one of the payments that falls out of that social security system. And I'm sure that you would all agree that it makes sense that as a society we have a income support payment that supports people who face, who find themselves in, in situations where they're unable to work because of illness or disability. And that's something that we want to protect and promote. But there's a however, and I've got a question. How many of you have, had to, have assisted someone who's had challenges accessing the DSP, even though um, it seems blatantly obvious to you that they sh should be able to get it? Put your hands up. That's a lot of people. Two hands at the front. So that's a, that's a lot of people. And I think w what that demonstrates to us is that it's not necessarily as easy to navigate as 
um, it could be, and it also demonstrates that Sometimes it doesn't pass the, the reasonable person test. You know, the, the requirements for accessing the disability support pension are tougher than many people imagine that they should be. Again, I'm not sure that I'm telling you anything new, but um, since 2012, the requirements for eligibility for the disability support pension have tightened a lot. And that's really been direct government policy that's led to that. So in the first decade of the 2000s, uh, two in three people who applied for the DSP were successful. We're now at a point where I've heard different figures, one in three, one in four people are being successful in their applications. So it's a significant change. And um, there's just under 760,000 people who are getting the DSP at the moment. It's expected that that figure will go down um, in the not too distant future. Uh, we also know that there's, you know, non-medical and medical uh, requirements or criteria that people have to meet to get the DSP, and the medical criteria in particular are, are not that straightforward or clear-cut. So I'm going to talk briefly about the Disability Support Pe Pension Toolkit that Social Security Rights Victoria um, developed in response to some of the issues that we saw coming through our door. So why we made it, this resource is a very intentional resource that's directed at trying to address a very specific issue and that was difficulties that people have in getting appropriate, appropriate medical reports to support their DSP claim. Um, and this this can be where, um, and I'm sure you've all experienced, where people live in rural and regional areas and can't access the appropriate treating medical professional, where people are being required to pay for reports that they can't afford, where medical professionals don't necessarily understand the criteria and don't necessarily address the required criteria in their medical reports, etc. Um, and it's not trying to duplicate great resources that I'm sure you've seen. You know, on our website, Legal Aid's re website, there are um, fact sheets about the disability support pension and letters to doctors who are, you know, on top of all these issues, who've got relationships with uh, an individual and who've got the time and inclination to write good reports. That's not what this is about. This is where people have trouble getting reports. So, um, that's, yeah. so that's why we made it. How we made it is we had a volunteer by the name of John Beryl, who I'm sure many of you have come across in other um, places, who is, who is known for, to be someone who looks for very practical solutions to issues that arise. So he drove the development of this kit but the kit was direct, directed at, not at individuals applying for the pension, but more at those who are supporting them to apply for the pension. So workers, um, disability advocates, health workers, doctors, et cetera, other lawyers, et cetera. So what this kit is, is um, basically, it tells you, it provides a bit of background to the DSP but what it does is provide template letters built around each of the um, impairment tables. So uh, there's 15 impairment tables. I'm sure most people know that a, people, a person's um, disability or illness gets assessed as mild, moderate or severe against each of those tables. So basically there's template letters that workers can um, work with individuals to identify which are the relevant ones, pull them out, take them to the doctor and ask the doctor to complete. So either just fill in or add to or use as a basis for writing their own reports. Um, that's essentially what it's about. The way it's been developed is that it's supposed to be, um, we think, best delivered in conjunction with training because the kit isn't like an entire um, resource by itself. And we've had many 
um, training sessions, including in conjunction with DRC over the last 12 months or so, where we've rolled it out. Um, the kit is available on SSRV's website. Is it? Oh, and sorry, just before I turn the page, I guess well, this kit that we're talking about is more of an individual advocacy resource rather than a self-advocacy resource. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's... All right. Thanks, Gillian. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the resource that um, the DRC created in conjunction with um, a quite a few people with disabilities. Um, this project was funded under the state government's um, capacity building fund over the last 12 months. For the purposes of the DSP and Me project, we worked with the self-advocacy and indiv individual advocacy spheres in mind and recognising that it's often family members or trusted friends who support people through the process. We recognise that the process to apply for the DSP is complicated, time consuming, and simply inaccessible for many, in particular for people with intellectual disability, cognitive disability, um, people with English as a second language, and those who are experiencing pain and stress. It's not a, not a situation anyone wants to find themselves in, being too unwell to work, or too unwell to work enough to support themselves. It's an issue that not only affects individuals, but their families and those who support them. I just want to tell you a bit of a story about Philippa. Philippa um, engaged in our advocacy service probably about a year ago. Um, and this is what she said a few months ago to me, or she, we wrote this down together. I never once questioned whether Centrelink would accept my application for disability I always assumed that based on the criteria and my conditions, that I was clearly eligible and would receive the disability support pension. During this time, I was scared, dealing with horrific disabling symptoms, grieving the person I was and a career and friends I had to let go of. And I honestly thought that Centrelink would act in my best interest. I submitted my application to the best of my ability and trusted it was enough. Despite being limited in my functioning, I would go into my local office as it was easier, and I thought if they saw how sick I was, face to face, they could speed things up. That didn't work, and the inconsistency of the advice I received and the staff knowledge was hard to manage. I was denied a specific case manager and was being told different things by different people. I'm currently on New Start, but I'm exempted from the requirement to look for work as I'm too unwell. And I'll come back to F Philippa shortly. So the DSP and Me guide, it's a guide that takes you step by step through what you need to know before you make a claim for DSP so that you understand what their requirements are and have the best chance of making a successful application if you're eligible. Okay. Oh, my pages are stuck together. It's always the way. Um, so why did we make DSP and me? The DSP is not a nice to have. It's not an optional extra. And it's often people who most struggle with the application who need this income support the most and it shouldn't be so hard. So the purpose of our project was to create a resource in plain English and easy English so that people could have all the information in one place to apply for the DSP either on their own or with a person that they trust. This resource would have details of who they could contact if they ran into difficulties or questions. Um, how we made it. It was important that DSP and me reflected the experience of people who have or are currently going through a DSP application themselves or with um, family members. And we met with about 40 people to learn what the barriers are, where they found help and support, um, what their ideas were to make things easier, and what advice people would give others who were starting out to apply for a DSP. 
We involve people with disabilities in every stage of the project, from planning, focus groups, developing and review of DSP and me. And every participant were given a Colesmeyer voucher for their contribution. Um, so who can use it? DSP and me was created for people who think they may be eligible for the DSP. We do realise that there will always be people who do need individual advocacy support. For those people who don't have um, family or friends to help them, or they've tried and they just haven't been able to navigate it. And in these cases, DSP and Me is a resource that allows individuals to be part of the process. So it's not something that happens to them, but with them. And they can go through um, DSP and Me to know what's happening now and what happens next. Uh, how can you use it? Since we completed DSP and Me, our process has been um, that when people contact us for a DSP assistance, we first seek to identify where they are in the steps. We ask them whether they have support and if they have any questions. And at that point, we offer them uh, to send them a copy of DSP and me and encourage them to have a go at the next step and to work with people in their family or their friends if possible. And then if they have any questions or problems, that there's phone numbers in DSP and me that they can use to find out the answers. Um, more often than not, the issue is that they have not been able to get the essential medical uh, evidence. And DSP and me has some hints on how to prepare for meeting with um, treating doctors. And on page 14, there's actually a letter for the doctor, so they can understand, I guess, in a snapshot, um, what Centrelink are looking for, and also how they can access um, SSRV's toolkit for workers. Um, where to find it? Um, it is on our website at the moment, um, which is up here. Um, and we have provided hard copies to those organisations who have agreed to be um, in our Get Help directory in the toolkit. And I still do have some copies of it if um, anyone wants some. Um, so back to Philippa. A couple of weeks ago, um, I followed up with Philippa to see how she was going. We had sent her a copy of DSP and me in June. And this is what she said over email. Oh boy, I actually got a text from Centrelink today booking me in for an interview. I hyperventilated when I got it. I'm assuming it's a job capacity assessment. I reapplied a couple of months ago. I have most of my info into them, just some super stuff that's taking me a bit lot longer to get onto. I'm doing the best I can. I have a better supportive doctor now who filled out a form and has, has me at 20 points on the fatigue table. So hopefully this time I get through. Thanks for following up and good luck with everything. And I just wanna say the, the change in her from when I first spoke to her late last year to now, I, I think she has a sense of, I have what I need now to do it myself. Whereas before at the start, she was quite overwhelmed and unsure of why her first application was rejected. So um, I hope that we have lots more stories like that and that we hear some from the advocacy agencies who are using DSP and me. Back to you. Okay, so just to reiterate the difference between the kits is that um, DSP and me is very much focused on self-advocacy, but also for use by workers to assist people around applying for the um, disability support pension. Whereas SSRV's um, DSP toolkit is very focused on trying to, to access medical evidence by the use of templates where um, there's difficulties in getting a good fuller report. And we've had found that some people have had success with it and other people have um, met some pushback from um, Centrelink. Some have persevered through that and got good results and others have been a bit disappointed by it. So we're interested in your feedback. 
about how you go if you use it. The other thing that we just wanted to talk about was the processes that we, each organisation used in the development of the kits. So social security rights, when the decision was made to prepare this kit, it was felt it was very important to have um, people who would be using the kit as part of its development. So a working group was set up with representatives from Disability Peak and advocacy organisations, from um, medical associations and from other legal organisations and from academia. That group met a number of times over the period um, to, to inform and provide feedback about the development of the kit. One, um, and that work led to the development of a kit, but it also had other um, positive benefits, one of which was working together on DSP and me kit. Did you want to talk about your process at all? The, the, I think I did come throughout. Enough. Yep. You want to flick to the yep. next slide? <laughs> yeah, okay. pretty good picture. I feel like, okay. So, uh, but, but your process had sort of more... Um, more people who are involved in the sector I, directly. In, okay, yeah. yeah, I did kind of touch on that, that we did involve people with disabilities at every stage of our project, but also we um, benefited from having Gillian on our committee that oversaw our project. And um, Mary at the front here was on our um, committee as well. And Jeanette, who was someone who worked, actually worked at Centrelink for a number of years. And that collaboration really created um, depth to the project and expertise that we didn't necessarily have. Um, so thank you to everyone who was involved on every level of the project, yeah. But also what else, some other things have fallen out of those collaborations. So DRC and SSRV ran training for advocates at the beginning of July around both of the, the kits that we've been talking about. Um, SSRV and um, some members of the disability sector have worked together on a human-centred design um, project proposal that we've sought funding for. Um, I'm sure they were doing this work before, but um, from some of the work that we've been doing, the Australian Federation of Disability Organisations became involved and they've taken, um, they sort of like an offshoot and taken a lead very much on systemic advocacy around um, the disability support pension, but they've involved new, um, new players in that advocacy as well. So it's created, um, there's been a lot of relationship building coming from it. And another thing for um, SSRV, I'm sorry, Trevor, I haven't talked to you about this, but the work with the disability, more formal work with the disability sector really highlighted for us, if this is such a big part of our work, then the sector should be really represented on our, in our governance and informing the work that we do. And so um, Trevor Carroll, who I'm sure most of you know, has been, you know, was invited to join our board and has participated in the board for the last 18 months. And, is having a big impact about in us our thinking about how we um, design and deliver our services. So uh, initial collaboration has led to a lot of a um, lot of other benefits. We think for our organisations and for the people that we're seeking to assist. Okay. Well, it looks like we have five minutes spare. So wondering if there were any questions. Um, do you want? Do you need a microphone? <laughs> or is it a, or can I just repeat it? Um, thanks, Wayne. Hello. Oh, there I am over there. Um, yeah, I'll be the microphone runner, like um, Adriana Exedides to, um, what was his name? Baby John Burgess, I'm showing my age. <laughs> Thanks, Wayne, and thanks for the opportunity. It's Trevor Carroll here. Um, a, a question about the DSP and the decline in numbers of people who are eligible for that. Now, a couple of years ago, it was around about 860,000, 870,000. So we're looking at a $200,000 drop in the number of people who are receiving the DSP. And the federal government's mantra is the best form of welfare is a job. Mm -hmm. 
How many of those 200,000, do we know how many of those 200,000 have been taken off the DSP, have actually gone off Newstart and got a job? Do we know how many people have actually got a job? Because that's been one of the reasons uh, mm -hmm. why the tightening has happened to get them a job. How many have actually got a job? How do we find that out? Yeah. So I haven't seen um, figures about that, and I'm not. There has been a review of some people's eligibility for the disability support pension. Like there's a rolling review, but most of it's been most of the attention's been focused on um, new people applying for the um, DSP. But we do know that there's a lot of people who are caught in that nexus between New Start and the Disability Support Pension. Um, either who are people who are on New Start who um, are told by job active providers that they're too unwell to continue on to meet the requirements of New Start, but they find that they're not their illness or disability isn't enough for them to be eligible for um, GSP, which is a very um, difficult situation for people to be in. And there's also, our experience has been that there's many people who are on New Start who are being required to um, meet job activity requirements who having to do that is actually exacerbating their illnesses as well. So people with mental health who are being required to um, go for a job interview, mental health issues being required to go to job interviews, not being successful, um, stress from that or that kind of thing which makes their conditions worse. So I didn't answer your question directly. I don't know the direct answer, but there's a lot of people caught in the middle and I'm not sure that um, that policy that you're talking about, that the government's policy is being successful. I want to um, give thanks to both Kerry and Gillian for an insightful session. One of the things I reflect on though is one of the other mantras of the current Morrison government is if you, have a go, you get a go. And I think, you know, we've been trying all our lives as people with disability and advocates, you know, so I'm not sure how much more of a go I personally can have. And I'm sure I'm not alone in saying that people with disability work hard, we achieve great things, and we achieve great things through having fair and equal access to a social security system that, as the panellists have said, is rightfully a human right. And I was in a conference in Perth just recently where I heard our new Disability Discrimination Commissioner reflect that Australia ranks 29 out of 29 OECD countries for poverty. What a great stain that is on such a great country as Australia, and it is indeed the work that we do every day that is seeking to change that. But we need systems and structures and government support that enable people to access everything they need to live their best life. And it is in that spirit that I thank both Gillian and Kerry for their contribution today.